there was no question in my mind that when I was set on this journey, on this path of discovery, of what fears crushes men's spirits, there was one man that I knew I had to talk to, one man that I knew would encourage us, challenge us even, to come from the dark and into the light. That man is Deacon Harold Burke Sivers. Amen. God, our Father, we honor and bless and praise you on this day, the feast day of St. Teresa of Avila. Lord, we ask you through her intercession to send your Holy Spirit to be with us as we continue this documentary, as we unfold and unpack uh, what it means to be an authentically Catholic man. Lord, we ask you to be with us, to protect us, to protect this equipment so that your work in this world can continue to be done through uh, Joe and through all the incredible work that he's doing for you and, and for our blessed mother and for the church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, mm -hmm. oh, Son, He can hear our word service. Thank you for doing this. I'm um, honored to be here, Joe. Thank you for having me. So you've traveled 200,000 miles in the last year or so. You've probably talked to thousands of men. Yes. It, could you sum up what are some of the woundedness and some of the fears that men tend to hold on to or, or suffer from? Yeah, so um, all of us have a tendency to be weighed down by the things of the past. Uh, the people who have hurt us, people who have abused us. Maybe you were the kid who had braces or had glasses or had the wrong accent or maybe you were the wrong color or maybe you were the one that was doing the bullying because maybe you were being abused at home and the only way that you can find relief is to take it out on others because you were helpless. So now you're making other people feel like you as helpless as you felt, mm -hmm. you know, or maybe you're burdened by someone who cheated you uh, out of something. Maybe you uh, assaulted a, a young lady when you, know, maybe you were in college and she was a little tipsy and you thought you'd take advantage of the situation. There's all kinds of things from our past that burden us down now. And what God wants us to have is have the true joy of the Lord. Um, but what people are doing, they're trying to find happiness without first finding the joy. Huh? It's the joy of the Lord that leads to true happiness in life. So unless we're able to deal with those wounded things of the past, we cannot find joy. And if we cannot find joy, we then cannot find happiness. Mm. So how does the guy begin to deal? How does he begin to identify his wounds? And how does he begin to even deal with them? All right. I would say four things, Joe. First of all, he has to recognize that what happened in the past actually happened. Mm -hmm. A lot of men just want to deny that it happened. Oh, if, if I don't think about it, then it never happened. Yeah. And if you do that, it will come back to bite you and bite you hard. Mm -hmm. let, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, when I was still active in the parish, I had left for the day to go home. And the administrative assistant called and said, hey, I just got a call from a guy. He sounds distraught. Uh, he said he needs to talk to you right now. I said, is he a parishioner? No, he's not a parishioner, but he just said he needs to talk to you. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, so I to tell him to come to the parish. So I turned the car around, went back to the rectory. We met in the parlor. He shows up. He's crying. He's distraught. He's disheveled. He's beside himself. I said, okay, sit down. Look, look, to tell me what's going on. He said, my wife, she, she threw me out of the house and, and she's going to call the police and she's talking about a restraining order. I said, whoa, 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 what's going on? So he tells me that he's been married for a little over 10 years. They have two beautiful children, a son and a daughter. Mm -hmm. And his wife works uh, as an attorney and he stays home with the kids. So uh, everything, you know, the, the typical routine, everything was fine. He'd have dinner ready. She'd come home and, and they'd, we'd, they'd spend some time with the kids and then have dinner and go through their daily routine. Except for tonight. She comes home and just like normal, he's playing with the kids and dinner's on the stove. And for some reason, she looks at how he's holding the daughter and, he, and she says, why are you touching her like that? And he said, what, what are you talking about? He said, I'm playing with the kids like I always do. Don't touch her like that. Get out of the house. You know, it throws out the house, going to call the police restraining order. He's just totally confused about what's going on. Now, as he's speaking, I'm thinking in my mind, I think I know what's going on. So when he finished, I said, 
Has your wife ever been molested as a child? Wow. He said, what? He said, Deacon, we've been married for over 10 years. Or we have a normal sex life. We have two kids. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I said, here's what I think happened. I think that your wife was abused as a child and everything was fine with your son and everything was fine with your daughter until your daughter got to the age in which she was abused as a child. And for whatever reason, tonight, she comes home and the way you were holding your daughter triggered something in her mind, a memory from the past, and she is now transferring that memory of what happened to her onto you. And he goes, what? what? This never came. I, I, I said, oh, hold on. I said, do you have her parents' phone number? He said, yes. I said, call it right now and put it on speakerphone. So he calls and, and her dad answers the phone. He says, dad, he tells her the story and the dad kind of already has an idea what's going on. And he says, has she ever been abused? Dead silence on the other end of the phone. In fact, it was so quiet, he began to say, dad, are, uh, dad, are you there? And finally, the father says, yes, actually she was abused. She was abused by the brother of a babysitter. And when we found out about it, you know, we got stopped, we had therapy, and then we never brought it up again. It was the family secret. Mm -hmm. And so now all these years later, because they hadn't adequately dealt with this thing from the past, it now came to bite this man and ruin his family. Think about what happened. He went to court. And you can imagine what happened. Here's the mother who's an attorney. Goes in the court, I came home, here's what I saw. Versus the stay-at-home dad who's home with the two kids by himself. Yeah. She did get the restraining order. Not only that, the man lost his job because he is now in the sex offender registry. The man's life is ruined because they failed to deal adequately with the issues of the past. So when you have something that happened to you, don't bury it. Feel it. Mm. Feel it. Feel the anger. Feel the pain. Feel the upset. Bring it to the surface because now God can heal it. Mm. Once you recognize and acknowledge it, God can now begin the process of healing it. Number two, we have to fight with the weapons of God. Mm. You know, my, my, the example I love is, uh, is David and Goliath, huh? Yeah. You know, Dave, Goliath was this, uh, if you look at he it says six cubits in a span. So a cubit is 18 inches, a span is half a cubit or nine inches. So he's nine feet, nine inches tall. Wow. Weighing 5,000 shekels of armor. Now, a, a shekel is 0.4 ounces. So if you do the math, 125 pounds. So a nine feet, nine inch dude with 125 pounds of armor comes at you. And what was the, was it tells us in 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 um, in, in First Samuel chapter chapter uh, twelve of, of what happened with the Saul and all the soldiers? They were afraid. Yeah. They were afraid. And so many men are afraid to face the Goliath in their own life. Yeah. So what does David do? David comes. He goes. He hears the challenge of Goliath, mocking. The armies of God, just like our Goliaths from our path, from our past mock us. Mm. You can't, I'm alcohol. I'm pornography. You, I'm Goliath. And what do we do? We, we cower under the fear. huh? We cower because he's so big and he's so, or even the Goliath of the culture. Abortion, euthanasia, the so-called redefinition of marriage, transgenderism, all this stuff, the, divorce. These are all the Goliaths of the culture and in our own lives. So it's, it's so much yeah. and we get afraid. But David says, no, we're going to stand here while this uncircumcised Philistine mocks the armies of God. Oh no, we got to do something. So he goes to Saul and he says, Saul, I want to fight Goliath. And Saul's like, <laughs> dude, this guy, this guy's going to kill you, man. You're just a kid. This guy's been a soldier since he was a kid. And David said, you know what? I get it. I'm a shepherd. I'm out there with the sheep. I get it. But you know what? If a lion or a bear took a sheep, I left the other sheep behind. I went after that one. That sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Didn't Jesus say, I am the good shepherd. I leave the 99 behind and go after the one. That's why one of Jesus' titles is son of David. Mm -hmm. And David said, when I caught that sheep, or that caught that bear or that lion, 
I snatched the sheep out of its mouth. If that lion or bear turned on me, I smote that lion and bear. I'll do the same thing to this Philistine. So I was like, your funeral, dude. <laughs> so what does David do? Makes his only mistake. He puts on Saul's armor. He said he clothed himself with a coat of mail. He put a, a helmet on his head. He got a sword in his hand. He looked like Goliath. But David said, I, I, I'm not useless. I, 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 he took him off. Because he recognized you cannot defeat the Goliaths in your life with the weapons of man. Mm. So what did he go to Goliath with? He had a staff in his hand. He went to the brook and got five smooth stones. He put them in his shepherd's bag or wallet. And he had a sling and he went toward Goliath. So he went to his shepherd's bag or wallet and he pulled out a sling and five smooth stones. Huh? A sling and five smooth stones. Now, if we understand biblical typology, I think that David faced Goliath with a type of rosary, the sling, and then the five stones representing the five wounds of Christ, or each of the five joyful, sorrowful, luminous, and glorious mysteries of the rosary, each of those five decades of, of yeah. the, because David understood you can only defeat the Goliath in your life with the weapons of God. And so now what happens? He goes to face Goliath. And what does Goliath say to him? He goes, am I a dog? <laughs> you come to me with sticks? And when we men start to face those Goliaths in our own lives, the Goliaths of the culture, they're going to say the same thing. Wait a minute, I'm abortion. <laughs> I'm divorce. I'm the so-called redefinition of marriage. I'm alcohol. I'm pornography. I'm anger. And you think you can beat me with your rosaries? And your chapels of divine mercy? And your Eucharistic adoration? I'm Goliath! And what does David say? David said, you come to me with sword and javelin and spear. I come to you in the name of the Lord God, whom you have defied. He, so what is the, he comes, uh, he, he said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. What do we say at every holy sacrifice of the mass? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We say the same thing at every mass that David said when he faced his Goliath. And we have to have that same courage and fight with the same weapons of faith. And we will defeat that Goliath in our life. Mm. You know, I saw a, uh, a sign I was driving yesterday and I saw a big sign, this ginormous, right outside of a bar. And it said, because therapy is more expensive. Mm. How many men are medicating themselves because they haven't pieced those puzzle pieces together? That's right. That's right. So look, if you're an alcoholic, you, de you do need to go to AA, but you also need to fight with spiritual weapons as well. You know, so it's not either or, it's both and. But look, here's the thing. When we have these kinds of emptiness and pain in our life, it creates a chasm, a void. Mm -hmm. And as human beings, we don't like to have that feeling of emptiness in our lives. So what do we do? We try to fill it. We try to fill it with drugs and alcohol and porn, things that make us feel good. Because again, as you said, Joe, we're trying to, to medicate ourselves, to anesthetize the pain and the memories from the past. But what happens is it's like, it's like a, a void. It just keeps falling and falling. It never closes this. Because only a deep, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ and him crucified as a man of God, that's what starts to close this gap and bring our lives back into focus, back into deep Meaning, surrender. you know, so yeah, it has to be surrender. But here's the thing. We often think surrender means being weak. Yeah. When we look at Christ on the cross, what does the culture say? Oh, he lost. Oh, he's defeated. Look, they, they got him. Mm. But it's through that death that brings us to life. Think about it. There is no Easter Sunday without Good Friday. Right. Yeah. There is no resurrection without crucifixion. Right. And what does the Psalm say? Psalm, Psalm 90. Our, our span is 70 years. Or 80 for those who are strong. And most of these are emptiness and pain. They pass swiftly and we are gone. Most of them, wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> our emptiness and pain. Most of life is the cross. Most of life is the cross. So we have to, yes, we look at the cross, we focus on the cross, but we know that that is not the end. 
And so we talk about uniting ourselves with the sufferings of Christ. Look what St. Paul said in 2 Corinthians. He was afflicted with something. We don't know what it was, mental or physical. But he said, the Lord said to him, my power is made perfect in weakness. It is when I am weak, it is then that I am strong. Because Paul understood that that weakness that we have, that we all have as men, can that weakness that can only be strengthened fully if we give it all over to Christ. Yeah. You know, and, and, but it's not it's not weakness to give to make yourself vulnerable because Christ on the cross is vulnerable. There's a beautiful gift of vulnerability there, and it's in that vulnerability that we find our strength as men. I love when David uh, lopped off Goliath's head with his own sword. Yes, and kept the sword. He used the sword for the rest of his life That's whenever he was in battle. And mm -hmm. it kind of reminds me of the cross, you know, that, that uh, you know, it was meant for evil, but that sign has become our salvation, the sign of our salvation. And we've kept it for remembrance. And even St. Paul in Galatians 3 says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, before whose eyes Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. That means there was a crucifix in the first century that he was showing them. And it kind of reminds me of Goliath's sword, you know, and it's that... The devil is defeated through the very, the very thing that he thought he would defeat us in. That's right. And it's that, it, that is counterintuitive, right? Because a secular man puts his faith in the world and what he can accomplish himself and his own resilience. But he's never happy, is he? That's right. Because you don't first have joy. See, there's a difference between joy and happiness, right? L look what happens when you try to find happiness without first finding joy. Disaster. Mm -hmm. For example... Um, take take the, the famous golfer Tiger Woods, right? Mm -hmm. Probably a great guy. But think about it. He could have been the greatest golfer in history. Yeah. Past Nicholas, past Watson, past Snead. Could, could have been the best. But what took him down a few years back? It was biblical, right? <laughs> Pornography and prostitutes. Yeah. Now think about it. The man had everything that this world says we need to have to be happy and fulfilled as men. He had the money, he had a beautiful wife, he had kids, he had the, 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 con the contracts and endorsements, winning tournaments, he had everything. And it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Because he's trying to be happy without first finding joy. What is the key to joy? Paul tells us in Romans chapter, in chapter, Romans chapter 12. He says, um, when you focus on the things of the flesh, and the word he uses for flesh there in Greek is not the, Jesus using flesh in John chapter 6, you know, when yeah. he uses sarx, sarx, which means like flesh on the bone, yeah. right? So Paul, when he uses the word flesh there, soma, it means fleshy, the things of the world, earthly things, yeah. fleshy things. If you focus on the things of the flesh, then your mind will be on things of the flesh. If you focus on the things of God, on the things of the Spirit, your mind will be on things of the Spirit. Makes sense, but here's the key. To set the mind on the flesh is death. Now, the word mavet in Hebrew doesn't mean just die, for the word for death, not just, it means to cut yourself off from God's life. To cut yourself off from the life of God is death. So to focus on the things of the world is, means to cut yourself off from the life of God. But he says to focus on the things of the spirit, on the things of God, is life and peace. Mm. That's where the joy comes from. And when we have that life and peace by focusing on the things of God, on the things of the spirit, then we can have the happiness that we're all looking for in life. That's the key. So when Jesus was talking about dying to self, to find happiness, this, this is what he meant. Yeah, look, it's, it's when you give yourself away in love is when you truly find yourself in God. That man's heart comes alive yes. when he's pouring himself out in holiness and virtue and service. See, look, the, 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 the culture follows the uh, worship the Trinity too. Me, myself, and I. It's all about me. But Christ calls us to make a gift of ourselves to others. The, the, the Christ on the cross, he broke himself open and poured himself out in love. And we men are called to do the same thing. Break ourselves open and pour ourselves out in love for our wives, for our children, for the church, and for this culture. That's where our strength, that weakness, huh? That, that brokenness, but that's where our strength comes from. Because it doesn't come from me. 
It comes from Christ living in me. Right? That's why Paul says, I preach Christ and Christ crucified. I want to know nothing except the cross of Jesus Christ. Mm. And that's why so many saints are willing to suffer. Because they see in that suffering, in that weakness, the fullness of God's grace coming through. And, and God's power working in that weakness so that his strength prevails over anything that may hold us back from having deep, personal, loving relationship with the living God. Mm. And so Paul reminds us of this in Ephesians, right? Because our job is to serve protect and defend as men that was our mission in the garden he put in the garden is a garden mean to till and to keep it right the word for till in hebrew is abad which means a work that's in the form of service and to keep is shamar which means to protect and defend so what god was doing by putting man in the garden he was giving him his mission his purpose his calling serve protect and defend everything i am entrusting to you but he forgot his mission because when the, Satan came and tempted his wife and he went after the woman, why? Because the woman has a special intimacy with the Holy Spirit as a life giver and a life bearer. I, you know, I remember that beautiful truth at every mass when we, uh, Sunday when we pray the, the creed, credo et spiritus sanctus dominum et vivificantem. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. Mm -hmm. So a woman has that special intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Uh, because by the very nature of how God created her, she's a life giver and a life bearer. So Satan says to himself, if I can destroy that, everything else will fall. Mm -hmm. And so what was Adam's job? To protect and defend his wife against the onslaught of evil. But when it came, when it came down to it, he stood there and did nothing. He did nothing and allowed Satan to destroy his family. He, because it says, you know, who was with her. It doesn't say that in Hebrew, but in, in, in the translation we use it, who was with her, because it's when, when Satan says, you, you, uh, when you eat of it, you will be like God. The you there is plural. Mm. You see? So in English, when you say you, you can mean you, or it can mean well, you, in right? Texas, we say y'all. Y'all, right? You say y'all, right? Uh, so, but you, in English, you can't get that sense across of what you're talking about. Yeah. So that's why they added in, in that English translation, who was with her to show it was plural. He was talking actually to both of them. Mm. So he was there. He heard what Satan said to his wife, but he did nothing. Nothing. That's why the cross is so powerful, huh? It, it because seems now, like he was he was king over creation, and that snake was a creature, and therefore he should have been king over that creature too, and commanded. It. Exactly. And look at Saint Joseph, right? Here's a man who has no lines in scripture. <laughs> the, the, the man says there's nothing recorded that he that, that he's ever says, but his actions speak louder than his words. Where Adam failed, Joseph served, protected. And defended the holy family because that was his job. He didn't have to say anything. He just was obedient to his vocation. That's it. That's it. And look, and look how the Lord came to him. Four times is recorded that the angel came to Joseph. What was he doing each and every time? Sleeping. <laughs> There's something about stillness. And I silence. I thought you were going to say laziness. <laughs> no, no. No, there's a stillness and a silence yeah. and a quiet where we have to listen to God's voice as men yeah. and allow that voice to change our lives. We cannot get distracted by all the noise and all the distractions of the culture because we can't hear God's voice. Mm -hmm. That's why, for example, Eucharistic adoration is so important mm -hmm. for a man to go in before the Lord. Now, you, you see, some men are saying to themselves, wait a minute. <laughs> I can, I can pray anywhere. I can pray in my car. I can pray in my house. I can pray walking to work. That's true. Yeah. You can pray while I'm hunting. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's true. But let me put it to you like this. When I travel, you know, I have to talk to my wife via Skype or FaceTime or something like that. And that's nice. I get to see her. I get to talk to her. But I'd rather be with her. Because isn't it always better to be in the presence of the person that you love when you're talking to them? And so you might be saying to yourself, okay, well, what about um, the tabernacle? I can just pray in front of the tabernacle. That's true. You can do that too. But think about it like this. Say you invite somebody to your house that you love. When a person gets to the door, you say, um, you see that chair out there? Just put it in front of the door and sit down. And you sit down on the other side of the door. You have a conversation with the person through the door. That works. But 
Isn't it always better to be in the presence of the person that you love mm. when you're talking to them? That's what adoration is about. And so I encourage, I, I, I can't even encourage enough men to go to adoration. Because when you're in there, you're there not to talk, but to listen. Psalm 46 verse 11 says, be still and know that I am God. And the word there in Hebrew, yalda, for know, means knowledge gained by experience. So in a sense, you could say it says, be still and experience God. Wow. In that silence and in that quiet, just the way St. Joseph did. And allow God to speak to you as a man, to speak to your heart, to speak to your mission, to help him to break down those barriers and those walls that we have put up between us and our relationship with the Lord. Yeah. So that the Lord can begin and truly change our lives, our minds, and our hearts so we can truly be the men that he created and calls us to be. Wow. I can also see a lot of guys maybe start hearing this and maybe start to think, yeah, but he can, you don't know, my wife. She's a nagger, she's a complainer, she's, she treats, she doesn't respect me, she's, she doesn't love me, she, doesn't, she just gives me grief, she just chews me out. The minute I walk through that door, nothing but hell. Yeah, okay, look, Paul says in Ephesians 5, right, this is always a controversial verse in, a, in, a, in Ephesians 5 verse uh, t uh, 21, right? Wives, be submissive to your husbands as to the Lord, right? Because yeah, Verse 24, because a husband is head yeah. of his wife. Well, here, here's the thing. Um, what is Paul saying there? First of all, he goes, he says, wise be submissive to your husbands. And the word there in Greek is hupatasso. And hupatasso is a word that was used by Roman soldiers to describe troops arranged in divisions that placed themselves under the mission of a leader, typically a general. Mm -hmm. So what is Paul saying? Wives, place yourselves under your husband's mission. What is his mission? Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ show his love for the church? He died for her. He gave his life for her. So our job as men is to serve, protect, and defend. To die to ourselves every day of our lives and to live for our wives, for our children, for our church, and for the culture. So, and Jesus gives the model. I have not come to be served, but to serve and to lay down my life. Mm. He gives, our, our Lord gives us the model of how we're supposed to serve as men. So the more we're able to do that in the home, now here's what happens. We are so wrapped up in the things of the world, as I mentioned before, that the woman says, oh, I got to pick up the slack. I got to take the kids to church. I have to be the one to pray for him. He's watching the game or he's out with his buddies. He's doing, look, the more we begin to live in the way that Paul is teaching us in Ephesians 5 to live as a man, to serve, protect, defend, especially in Ephesians 5, to serve, mm -hmm. to die, and to live for others. Again, that, that kenosis, right? That complete outpouring of self to the other. Then the woman will say, you know what? He's doing what he's called to do. Now I can do what I'm called to do. And you have a much harmonious relationship in that marriage. Now, one guy wrote me a letter. He goes, Deacon Howard, you're ruining my marriage. He said, I, you know, uh, uh, when, I, when I got married, I showed my wife that verse. See, you're supposed to be submissive to me. So he said, if, if I told her to get me a beer, she'd get me a beer. If I told her to jump in the bed, she'd jump in the bed. But now she's watching you on that channel with the nun. And now she's telling me my job is to protect the discernment. What are you doing? And after I explained to him what I just explained to you, I said, open your Bible, my friend, to Genesis chapter 3, 16. Now, Genesis 3, 15 is that beautiful proto-evangelium, the first gospel, where the, the Lord, God says to the serpent, I will put enmity, complete and perfect opposition between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Mm -hmm. But then comes the temporal punishment for the woman. I will greatly multiply your pain in childbearing, and pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, the word for rule over is malshal in Hebrew, which means to dominate like a tyrant. Wow. <laughs> so the fact that a man abuses his wife physically, emotionally, spiritually, sexually, any other kind of way, is a sad and tragic effect of original sin. It is not God's plan. Paul is returning us 
to what God's original plan is for our spiritual fatherhood. Because all men are called to be fathers, whether fathers in a, a family or fathers in a parish yeah. or single men who are called to be that fatherly witness to our culture and society today. A lot of guys are wounded from their childhood, as we talked about earlier, whether the parents were divorced or there was abuse or, or even verbal and mental abuse. There's a lot of cases of that. And I think a lot of guys are faking it in their marriages or their relationships or in their life, but they don't want to admit that outwardly because they've never been, no manhood hasn't been modeled to them. And so it seems like there are, there's a lot, they have a lot of behaviors that are, that are being manifested in their life that they can't put those, they can't connect the dots. They can't connect the dots between the, how they've been wounded in life and not dealt with it and their, their behaviors. How does a guy who might be watching this, how does he, how does he, what does he do? What's his, what steps does, should he take right now to, to begin to find any kind of healing satisfaction? Okay, so I mentioned two of them already, right? So the first one is to admit that what happened, happened in the past, to feel the pain of that divorce, because my, my parents are divorced, I'm a child of divorce myself, yeah, right? And as, as are you. Mm -hmm. So you, you understand, right? So there is a, a feeling of emptiness and brokenness, because I went to a marriage, remember I was in a monastery for a while, I thought I was gonna be a monk, and I have to deal with all of this. But now, when I met my wife, and now I'm married, I'm like, I don't know how to do this Oops. fatherhood <laughs> thing, because I didn't have it modeled for me, I have to figure this out on my own. Right? So again, the first step is to recognize that pain and to feel it so God can begin to heal it. Fight with the weapons of God. And then the next step, I would say, is a general confession. Mm -hmm. Now, some of you may have gone to confession and confessed the sins, and that's fine. But what I'm talking about is a general confession. That means that you go into the confessional and you confess all the sins that you've committed in your entire life. Even if you've already confessed. Yeah, see, it's not about getting the sin forgiven again because God has already forgiven the sin. But here's the problem. God forgets. It tells us in Ezekiel. God forgets the sin, but we don't. We don't, because we're still living with the memories, we're still living with the hurt from the past. So what a general confession does is allows you to see how far you've come, mm -hmm. how much healing God has brought into your life. You know why I compare that experience to? Like the prodigal son. My favorite part of that uh, parable is when he finally has the courage to turn back, right? And we talk about in Lent conversion or, or the Greek metanoia, which means literally to turn your mind around. So he literally turns his mind around, turns his life around. I have to go back to the father. Here's the best part. It says when he was still a long way off, the father caught sight of him, which means what? The father was looking for him the whole time. Mm -hmm. And same thing with us men, right? So we, if we have the courage to turn back toward God, he's always looking for us. He never forgets us. But he, he's not going to force his love on us either. When we turn back and have the courage and we have the strength, to, even though we think we're far away from where we should be in our relationship with God, what does the father do in the parable? He runs to meet his son. And God will run to meet us. He'll close the gap. He'll close the gap, but we have to have the courage to go to him. The general confession allows men to see how far they've come in that journey. Well, wait a minute. Wow, I've been healed from this. I've, been, uh, I've had this forgiven. I've, and they'll take another step and another step and another step. And as they keep taking that step, God is a, taking another step toward them. Mm -hmm. And that gap, that chasm we talked about, begins to close. And they begin to find healing. And they begin to revel in God's mercy. And he begins to give them the joy that their hearts are looking for. Now they're able to live their lives as true men of God. Wow. Here's the last step. This is probably the hardest one. To go to the person that hurt you and ask for forgiveness from them. Now, some people say to so, themselves, wait a minute, that's crazy talk. I didn't do anything, they're the ones that hurt me. And that's true. But it's, but remember, we're people of faith, right? When you look at that beautiful divine mercy image, the rays are coming out from the heart of Jesus. They're not coming back, they're going out. So what God is asking us to do to that last step of healing, which is difficult, is to ask forgiveness from the person that hurt us. Because what we're doing is we are being vehicles of God's divine mercy to that other person. 
Because God is using us as a vehicle of his mercy to bring healing to our situation by being a vehicle of mercy to the other person. Mm. It, it seems counterintuitive to the culture. But what does Paul say in, in Romans chapter, in Romans chapter, I think it's chapter one, right? Uh, or put, on, put on the mind of Christ. Oh, yeah. We don't think like the culture. We have to think like Christ. Right? And that's what we have to do. So, so we ask the person. I did it for my own father. You know, I, I mean, I was so angry and upset with my father over what happened growing up. that I didn't speak to him for almost 18 years. Wow. You know, and I told my children he was dead when they asked about him. You know, so, so I, I get it. I get the heal. I get the pain and the anger. But that last piece of healing was going to my father and asking him to forgive me for hating him for 18 years, for telling my grandchildren that he was dead. Um, and that was, a, along with the other three things that I mentioned, the powerful sources of healing and reconciliation and mercy. And if you're, the person hurt you is already dead, go to the gravesite mm -hmm. and sit down or kneel down at that grave and ask that person for forgiveness. It's, uh, the tendency is to repress. It's the tendency, if we've been wounded and hurt, we hold it in until we explode. Um, if we have dirty laundry, we don't air it in public. Sure. You know how that manifests itself? When you get so angry, you want to punch your wife in the face yeah. and you stop yourself. You go, where did that come from? Yeah. See, that's why I said you have to deal with and recognize and feel what happened. Don't suppress it because it's going to come out in another way. It's going to come out in that bottle. It's going to come out in that pornography. It's going to come out in all these different ways that are unhealthy ways that lead us away from God, away from our families, away from who Christ is calling us to be. So we have to deal with it so Christ can begin to heal it. Wow, we gotta let Christ into the dark spaces. Amen. I mean, what, is, what does Jesus say? I'm the light, but men prefer darkness rather than light. Because think about it. We've become too comfortable, Joe, as men. We've become too comfortable. And when you get comfortable, you know, you, you get comfortable, you get lazy. Mm. You know? But if we were to take our faith lives to that next level, we got to get uncomfortable. Mm. We gotta get uncomfortable. And allow God into that space so he can bring his love and his mercy and healing. Yeah, amen. Praise Jesus. Last, last question for you, Deacon. Uh, is there a, a certain routine, a certain habit? What should men be doing on a daily basis? It's the little things that make the biggest difference. Because someone will say, well, how can, how can I get to that next level? How can I? You start small. For example, every single morning. Just like this morning when I woke up, before my feet hit the ground, little prayer, Lord, thank you for allowing me to see the light of another day so that I may give honor, praise, and glory to your most holy name. So I'm starting off my day mindful that I am a son of the living God, that I have to live my spiritual fatherhood today in the way that he calls me to live it. Just a little simple reminder like that. When things are going bad or having a bad day or I'm angry with my wife or the kids, are, you know, three things. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I trust you. Jesus, I give my life to you. To be mindful. And, and one thing I would also add is to fill those spaces, what I call gap time in our days. Yeah. For example, when you're commuting to work, what are you listening to? Mm. Talk radio, sports. What about listening to a CD? What about listening to Guadalupe radio? What about listening to your, your local Catholic radio station or listening to a CD or MP3 and use those 20 to 30 minutes to grow in your faith, yeah. to deepen your relationship with Jesus Christ? Mm. How about that? You know, so we, we start purposely filling our time and our day with these little Reminders that we are sons of God. It doesn't have to be, oh, I, I don't know the Bible. I don't know. It, keep it simple and go to adoration every week. That would be the last. Go to adoration every week. Well, what do I do? I don't know what to do. Just go and be before God. Yeah. All God wants is our hearts. Hosea 6 verse 6. I want a loving heart more than sacrifice. Knowledge of my ways more than holocausts. So God wants you to bring your heart. If you're worried about something, if you're stressed about something, that's your adoration. That's what you have to offer the Lord. Give that to him. You're going to worry anyway. You might as well worry before Jesus. Amen. Yeah. You know, because he might even give you something. He might even, you see? And, and so it's just those little, you just have to do it. 
little things every day that make the biggest difference. Be part of a men's group in your parish. Yeah. You know, you, most will meet maybe once a week or a couple times a week or once a month. A yeah, I mean, because look, you know, in, in Ephesians 6 in the armor of God, you know, Paul talks the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, um, the helmet of salvation, shod your feet with the gospel of peace. The only part of the body that's not covered is the back. The back was completely exposed because the way the Roman soldiers fought during that time, they fought like in a semicircle. And they expected the person fighting next to them to, to protect their back. That's where we get the expression, I got your back from, right? Wow. So, so men, who's got your back? Who's got your back? You can't do this by yourself. Even Jesus needed help carrying his own cross. Yeah. So what makes you think you do this by yourself? We need the help and the support of other godly men. You know, so come together as groups of men. If, if, you, if you're not in a men's group, then do like an informal thing like I do. I get together with a group of guys when I'm in town, and we just get together over lunch. And we just talk about, so, hey, how you doing? You struggling with something? What can I help you with? How can I pray for you? How can, and we're supporting each other, nurturing each other as men. That's super important. Mm, wow. You gave me a lot, Deacon. Thank you, brother. You're most welcome, Joe. God bless you, brother. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you.